Welcome to Vox Church this week. We are so excited to be with you. God bless you, every home, every living room, every kitchen. Thanks for joining us for Church Online. This is a special Sunday. We are launching a new teaching series called Brave. If you're new to Vox, my name is Justin. I'm the lead pastor. Thank you for joining us. You know, it's been a crazy time, church meeting and all these various different unique ways during this summer, but I really believe that God has something special for you today. I believe that he has a word for your life today, and so I'm praying for you and believing that God's Holy Spirit is gonna move in your life today. This series, we're gonna be walking through the book of Acts. If you're not familiar with the book of Acts, it's in the New Testament. It records what the Holy Spirit did through the first believers after Christ rose from the dead and ascended into heaven. And so I wanna challenge you today to start reading one chapter from the book of Acts every single day and write down, maybe in a notebook or whatever you like to write in, write down what God's speaking to you each chapter. And so today you'd read Acts chapter one. Tomorrow, Monday, you'll read Acts chapter two, Acts chapter three, on and on and on. We'll do the entire book of Acts through the month of July and then we'll finish right in the beginning of August. And so I just wanna challenge you, do this with us. Also coming up, you can get all the information at voxchurch.org. We got some revival nights. Everybody right there in your living room, in your kitchen, say with me, revival nights, revival nights. And so these are special nights. I'm gonna be bringing a different word every night. We're gonna be worshiping Jesus and we're just gonna be believing for an outpouring and a filling of the Holy Spirit. And so I really believe these are going to be catalytic, supernatural nights of God's manifest power in your life. And so you don't wanna miss these. Go online, get all the information, and join as many as you can. It's gonna be wild. But I believe that God's Holy Spirit is really gonna move even as we continue to respect all the social distancing stuff. We play it careful and safe with the coronavirus and everything else, but we continue to meet in unique ways in special ways. If you have a Bible, Acts chapter two is where we're gonna be today, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. Acts chapter two, I'm gonna read a big chunk. I'm gonna read 21 verses. So get comfortable, get your cup of coffee, you know, and, uh, and read along with me. It's on the screen. It says this, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place and suddenly, everybody say suddenly, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting and divided as tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. At the sound of the multitude came together. They were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. They were amazed. I just lost my spot. They were amazed. They astonished. And they said, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia. I don't know how to say that one. Vrigria and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belong to Cyrene. Visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocked and said they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, saying, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words, for these people are not drunk as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And now he quotes the prophet Joel. In the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Somebody right there in their living room, say all flesh. I'll pour out my spirit in all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I'll pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above, signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness. The moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone, there's another word for you to say, everyone, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, shall be saved. You wanna jot some notes down? Part one of our new teaching series, Brave, as we walk through the book of Acts. Title of the sermon is, This is for you. That's the title of our sermon today. This is 
for you. Not just for your neighbor, not just for your brother, not just for your preacher, it's for you. Would you pray with me today? Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the power of God's Holy Spirit that right now abides in us and with us. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would manifest yourself, that you would speak in the way that only you can, that you would minister through me. Lord, I confess my dependence upon you. And I pray that, God, you make your word known to us in Jesus' name. God's people said all across Connecticut, Massachusetts, and beyond, amen. Amen. I remember when I was a little kid, and uh, I used to like, don't tell anybody, I used to like the, the TV show The Care Bears. I was 14 years old. No, I'm just kidding. I was much younger than that. I was much younger than that. But I remember thinking to myself, wow, the Care Bears, they must live up in those clouds because that's, that's what it shows in the, in the TV show. Uh, they must live up in those clouds. I, I, I can't imagine what it's like up there all in Care Bear land up there. I can remember so clearly thinking about that and believing in the Care Bears. I remember as a kid thinking that my toys were definitely alive and they played dead when I played with them. But then as soon as I left the room, I was sure that they were coming alive. I remember as a kid that there was a little tunnel in my backyard in the kind of in the woods in the back behind my house. And I was convinced that if I were to follow that tunnel, it would lead me into a secret passage to the other side of the world. I was convinced of those things. But then I went on an airplane and I can remember being devastated because I looked out over the clouds now in an airplane and I thought, where are all the Care Bears? Where is their base of operations? Because it seems to be nowhere to be found. I eventually stopped playing with my toys and my G.I. Joes. And finally, I went through that tunnel in my backyard and learned that it just led to the street next to mine and then dumped out. And that was the end of the tunnel. Didn't get me to the other side of the world. You know, sometimes I feel like we read the stories of the book of Acts. And some of us, look at me today, you've been a Christian for a long time, a follower of Jesus for five or 10 or 20 or 30 years. And you've read that story that I just read to you before. And unfortunately, when we read it, it sounds a little bit like the fantasy fairy tale Care Bear stories of our childhood. We think, oh, that's really nice. I believe in that. But it really has little application to our real world, to our 2020 problems, to the issues that are going on in our world this summer. You know, and uh, what I want to suggest to you today is that if you read the book of Acts as if it's just a collection of fanciful days gone by, it might be, listen to me today, one of the greatest mistakes you ever make in life. Because the book of Acts is in no way just a collection of silly fairy tale stories. The book of Acts, rather, was written as a description and a prescription for a different way of living. The book of Acts is an invitation into a life marked by miracles. It is an invitation to experience the supernatural in 2020, in your life, in your circumstances, in your world. What you have to see is that the things described in this book that we're gonna study for the next number of weeks as we read a chapter a day together as the family of God, the things described in this book are actually put there so that you can live and experience a life like that. Now, let me just be honest with you. If you took your life and you inserted it into the book of Acts, would it be the most boring chapter in the entire book? Or would it look like this book? Because I believe that it is God's intention for your life to be Acts chapter 29, for your life to look like the book of Acts and that you experience the power, the presence, and the transformational life that comes living with the Holy Spirit. So in John chapter 14, Jesus says everything is going to change. Everything is going to change when the Holy Spirit comes. Look how he describes it. He says, I'll ask the Father. He will give you another advocate. Some say counselor. And he will never leave you. That's a word for somebody right now who feels alone. He will never leave you. Look what it says. He is the Holy Spirit. So we're not trying to confuse it. He is the Holy Spirit. That's what I'm talking about. Who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him. Check this out. Why? Because it isn't looking for him and it doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. That's important. Now, first, it's interesting to note that Jesus says it's possible to not recognize the Holy Spirit. 
to not recognize the Holy Spirit and to not look for him. And if you don't look for him and don't recognize him, you might mistakenly believe that he is not available. It's possible to miss the opportunity. But the plan all along was that the Holy Spirit live in you. So Jesus Christ, after he says this statement, dies on the cross for our sins, is risen from the dead. And then he spends 40 days after his resurrection meeting with his disciples. And then he tells them to wait. And for 10 days, they wait in Jerusalem, waiting, praying, praying, and waiting until what was called the day of Pentecost, right? And when the day of Pentecost arrives, something changes. Now, you may not be familiar with Jewish festival tradition, so let me fill in a few gaps. The day of Pentecost was the second big festival in the Jewish calendar, okay? Now, remember, God is always foreshadowing New Testament truths in Old Testament stories. And so just as the Passover was the great first festival, and it was a special, a prophetic description of Christ who would become the Lamb of God slain, wiped on the doorpost of the house so that anyone who enters in is saved, not by what they've done, but by the blood that protects them from the angel of death like Egyptians experienced in the Old Testament. So Christ becomes that Lamb of God and is killed on the Passover on the cross. So all of it is a prophetic picture. So also this second festival, the festival of Pentecost, is the festival where they ex express their gratitude for the first fruits of the ingathering of the harvest, okay? And so the harvest festival was called the Pentecost. That word means 50 because it was 50 days after the Passover. And so the celebration of Pentecost was a declaration. The harvest has come and the glory belongs to God. And so now here we are, 120 people committed to Jesus. You'll notice in Acts chapter 1 and 2, they're very specific to tell us that it is 120. Whenever you see a number like that in the Bible, pay attention because God is up to something. 120 people gather in this upper room and we're told that there is, don't miss it today because God wants to just light your heart on fire. There is the sound of a rushing mighty wind and it fills the place and they have these tongues of fire that descend upon them. Now you have to understand, that what happens in Acts chapter 2 was foreshadowed all the way back in the Old Testament. And God gives us ancient pictures of New Testament blessings so that we can understand the implications of what he's doing in the here and now. And so in the Old Testament, you may not be familiar with the story. It's in 2 Chronicles chapter 5, where King Solomon has just completed the construction of the first ever temple in Jerusalem. It's a very exciting day. It's been generations where they've been preparing for this. And now they're going to have a house for the spirit of the living God. And we're told in 2 Chronicles chapter 5 that 120 priests, interesting in that number, right? They begin to in unison blow trumpets, right? Unified, 120, you're seeing the foreshadowing. And look what happens in verse 13. And it was the duty of the trumpeters and the singers to make themselves heard in in unison and praise and thanksgiving to the Lord. And when the song was raised and the trumpeters and the cymbals and other instruments in praise to the Lord, the house, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. And then this happens just a while later in verse one of chapter seven. And as soon as Solomon finished his prayer, fire came down from heaven, consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifice and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Now, 120 priests, all in one accord, the great cloud, the wind of God, the fire of God, all of these Old Testament experiences now being displayed in a unique way in the upper room. Why? Because God wants you to understand that this is the birthday of the church, that the Holy Spirit has come upon the people of God because Christ has paid for the sins of the world. So now he's starting a new priesthood. And rather than just 120 special priests like the Old Testament had, now every single believer in the upper room, the 120, everyone is a priest. Every single person is called to be a priest to God. Every believer. And now we're in one one accord. That's a musical word that they use in the gospel, in the book of Acts. One note is being sung in the spirit. And as every single believer looks to God in prayer, something happens. The wind comes, the fire comes, and the temple of God becomes the human heart. You, friend, every one of us who's believed in Christ, you are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now you have to understand that as soon as you trust in Christ, the scripture says you're filled with the spirit. In Ephesians chapter one, it talks about how all those who believe are sealed with the Holy Spirit. But we also see 
in the Gospels and in the book of Acts and beyond, that after a person is saved, is filled with the Spirit, they experience greater fillings of the Spirit that empower them to greater service. So take, for example, Peter. Peter is saved in the Gospels when he trusts in Christ, right? But he's not yet experienced an overflow of the Holy Spirit. And we see Peter acting arrogantly. We see him acting rashly. We see him acting cowardly as he runs away and denies Jesus three times, right? But then three times in the book of Acts, we're told that Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit. He's filled and then he's filled even more and then he's filled even more. And we see that he's transformed, that no longer is he arrogant, but he's humble, that no longer is he cowardly, he's bold, and no longer is he weak, he's experiencing the miraculous. He's seeing supernatural miracles, the sick healed, the dead raised as he begins to pray in faith. What's the difference between Peter and Peter? The difference is the filling of the Holy Spirit. That's the difference. And so the point of the book of Acts is that this filling of the Holy Spirit to launch you into a life of miracles is not just for Peter. It's not just for the disciples. It's not just for Paul. Look at me. It's for you. It's for the mom right now who's got three kids running around driving you nuts. You can't even focus on what I'm saying. It's for the 52-year-old man that you've been divorced twice. You're frustrated. You feel alone. You feel like you're not fitting in in this world. It's for that person that maybe you come from a different culture, different race, and you feel like you don't belong. You feel like you've been discredited. You feel like the world's against you. It's for you. It's for you. Listen to me. Regardless of where you are in the world, what you're dealing with, what you're struggling with, the story of the book of Acts is that God has power available for you. I love what theologian John Piper says about this. He says, this promise the disciples would receive power when the Holy Spirit came upon them and that they would be clothed with power from on high was a promise given to sustain the completion of world evangelization and all the ministry that supports it. The task of world evangelization is not yet complete. Therefore, the promise of this, look at this, extraordinary power to sustain and carry forth the work is still valid now still valid now. So I want to begin our series called Brave with some observations about a life filled with the Holy Spirit. And I pray that a fresh hunger, a fresh wind, a fresh fire would fall upon you even in your home right now as you listen and as you watch this. Look what it says in Acts 1 14. You're going to read this today because we're all reading Acts chapter 1 today together. But it says this, all of these with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer. This is during the 10 days that they were seeking God before the Holy Spirit was poured out together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. All of these, all of these. I think about this. I wonder what would have happened if the disciples had not devoted themselves to prayer for those 10 days. We don't know. We don't know what would have happened. We can never know for sure, but we do know that they did. And they did it as a model for us. And we're told that suddenly the Spirit rushed upon them. But if you've ever spent an extended time praying, you know that it might have looked like suddenly for the people on the outside, but I don't think it looked like suddenly for Peter and for Mary who had spent the last 10 days on their knees praying, waiting, waiting, praying, praying, waiting. It can get pretty boring. It can get pretty distracting. But they just stayed and stayed and stayed. See, what the Scriptures is trying to teach us is that you can always draw a direct correlation to the suddenlies in your life and the uncelebrated pursuit of God in the secret place of prayer. The more you pray, the more you seek, the more you pray, the more you seek, the more suddenlies will interrupt your world with the power of God. I couldn't remember so clearly as a young follower of Jesus when I first read Jeremiah 29, 13. I couldn't even believe it. That scripture changed my life forever. The prophet tells us, and this promise is yes and amen for all those who are in Christ, just as applicable to you today as it was when the prophet uttered it thousands of years earlier. He said this, you will seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. Now, just I hope that that promise comes alive inside your soul the same way it came alive inside mine those many years ago. Listen to it. You will seek me and you will find me. Whatever you're going through right now, you got a financial struggle. You got issues going on in your life. You got frustration with your kids. You will seek me. Listen, you will find me. Guarantee, ironclad, absolute, if you'll search for me with all your heart. You will seek me and you will find me. So the only thing that is separating you from finding God is a wholehearted pursuit. 
years ago. I read a book by Leonard Ravenhill. In the book, he said this, one of these days, some simple soul will pick up the book of God, read it, and believe it. And then the rest of us will be embarrassed. That quote has always inspired my heart because sometimes we make these things far more complicated than they need to be. What could happen if you began a wholehearted pursuit of God? What could happen if you prioritized reading the book of Acts with us these next 28 days? What could happen in your life? What could happen if you attended these revival nights coming up and you sought God and you prayed and you came with great faith? See, what I'm trying to do right now is begin to grow in you a spirit of expectation. Every single person watch this right now, say that word with me, expectation, expectation, expectation. This is what Jesus meant to do when he said, let it be done according to your faith. Let it be done according to your faith. I'm waiting for you to expect. Expect. I love what Charles Spurgeon said about expectation. He said, when God's church adds expectation to supplication, then a blessing tarries no longer. That's what he said. If you got supplication, that's prayer, and you add expectation, that's faith. Guess what? The promise is on its way. God is going to move. And I believe that right now, we are in the beginning of a move of God's Holy Spirit. I believe that this summer, the Spirit of God is going to blow through our church in a fresh and unique way, that we are going to experience what the saints of old called revival, spiritual awakening, a fresh passion for God, a fresh hunger to know Him, a new passion to see people meet Christ. I believe that even now, as I'm talking to you through this screen, God's Holy Spirit is beginning to grow in you an expectation, a greater passion for God. But this is what we learn in the book of Acts, that every move of God begins with intentional pursuit. Every move of God begins with intentional pursuit. Don't be surprised if you don't have an increasing passion for God, if you're not increasing your pursuit in prayer. But what could happen? If you actually increased your pursuit of God, what could happen if together we started increasing our pursuit of God? We're told in the text that there is a wind and a fire and then these tongues and they begin to speak other languages as they're filled with the spirit. Now, this is incredible. It's, it's incredible. You have to understand that this is, again, foreshadowed in the Old Testament, that in the book of Genesis, chapter 11, there is a story about men and women who build a great tower. And they in that story seek their own glory. And they are so unified, so committed to their own glory that the Spirit of God actually has to go down and confuse their languages to break up their unity. And so what we see in that story is that there's a great power in unity, but God confuses their language because their unity was for sinful gain. Now, the absolute reversal of that occurs in the New Testament, where a great unity comes upon the church, and they begin to all speak one language heard by each person as their native tongue, right? And so the sin of the world has been paid for on the cross. The church is born and the Holy Spirit takes up unity or uh, takes up uh, residence in every person's heart. And now those people with the Spirit of God living inside them are unified and begin to speak to a lost world and every single person hears it in their native Language. Look at the specifics. It's really profound in verse 5 of chapter 2. Stay with me. Check this out. It says this, Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews devout of every nation under heaven, right? And then it gives this big list. The sound of the multitude came together. They were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. They were amazed and astonished, saying, How are not all these speaking, are, these, are not all these speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of them in our own language? Then he lists all these Parthians, Medes, Elamites, Resident of Mesopotamia, all the ones I can't pronounce, right? Rome, both Jews, proselytes, Cred Credans, Arabs. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all these were amazed, right? So there's this moment. They all hear it in their native language. Now, the writer of the book of Acts, uh, Luke, records for us a number of different people groups, over a dozen people groups that are gathered in Jerusalem at this time. Interestingly enough, during this feast, the population of Jerusalem would go from about 150,000 to over a million people. So it was overrun with people. And they're all now hearing the works of God. He, he lists Parthians, Medes, Elamites. These are people from the east, 
We would call these people Arabs, okay, in this time. They were of Arab descent. And then he lists people of Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia. So these are Asians in the northern section over Israel, okay? And so you've got the east, you've got the north. And then he talks about Egyptians and Libyans. These are people from the south. They're Africans, okay? And so you've got, you've got Orientals, you've got Arabs, you've got Asians, you've got Africans. And then he talks about people from Rome and from Crete. This is the west. These are Europeans, okay? And so in this moment, in this prophetic divine, moment in history when the church is born all these groups all these races all these ethnicities come together and they hear the works of God in their own language see God's trying to teach us in this passage something so important about the church especially in a time where people are divided politically divided racially divided economically what we see is when the spirit of God comes there is a supernatural unity a power that pulls people together that allows us to hear each other that allows us to understand each other my goodness if there was ever a time where we needed to hear each other and understand each other it is now this is what Paul described in Romans chapter 12 look at he said and so in Christ we though many because church we're many we've got black we got white we got Asian we got Hispanic we got old we got young we got it all many form one body and each member I love this look at it belongs to all the others we form one body by one spirit. This is only possible by a powerful work of the Holy Spirit. But listen to me, I'm prophesying to you, Vox Church, God is doing it right now in your heart, in my heart, and in our church, in Jesus' name. This is the second observation I wanna make, that a move of God's Spirit pulls people together. It pulls people together. A supernatural drawing together. And that's what I'm calling out for. That's what I'm crying out to God for because our world needs to see it. And it's only possible by the spirit of God. We've got all our issues that will divide us forever. But the spirit of God can pull us together. And so Peter gets up and he quotes the prophet Joel. He says in verse 17, quoting Joel in the last days, it shall be God declares, I'll pour out my spirit. Look at it with me on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Young men see visions, old men dream dreams. Even on my male servants, female servants, in those days I'll pour out my spirit and they will prophesy. Notice he starts with all flesh, all flesh. That's every race, every color, all flesh, right? And then he says it's gonna be sons and daughters. So it's not just the racial divide, it's the gender divide. And then he says old and young, I'm gonna close the generational divide. And then he says even the servants, I'm gonna close the economic divide. And so what he's trying to get us to understand is that the spirit of God actually has the power to unite people who otherwise would never agree <laughs> and never come together. And so this is the hope of the church. And then he starts to talk about the return of Christ, right? Those verses that a lot of Christians today don't really know what to do with. The, the moon is gonna, you know, uh, the stars are gonna fall out of the sky. The sun is gonna be turned dark and the moon is gonna turn to blood and all these great and terrible things that it describes as the end of the world when Christ returns. But what we have to understand about this prophecy, don't miss this, it's God's word, it never changes, is that right now, Right now, 2020, summertime, you and me are living in between Acts chapter two when Peter says the church has begun and the return of Jesus when Christ actually bodily returns. And so this text has literally never been more applicable than right now. It is not some foregone text. It is a text for today. I love what Piper says about this. He says, do not think that this is beyond your reach. So many people make this mistake. Do not think that such an experience of God is for professional spiritual elite. No, 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 no. The point of Joel's prophecy is this, that the spirit will be poured out on all flesh, on everybody running the camera right now, Erica, Miguel, on every single person that can hear my voice in every single home, on all flesh, whether you are a man or a woman, old or young, servant or master, the promise is for you. It's for you. And so Peter gives his first ever sermon. And I love how the sermon ends. This is the way every preacher wants every sermon to end, right? Verse 41. So those who received the word were baptized and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. The church grows. I love it. Just this past couple weekends ago when we had parking lot church, and I had the privilege of sharing about Jesus and about the gospel, inviting people to raise their hands as a symbol of their surrender to Christ. And I watched night after night as hands shot up all across the parking lot. As people, I saw one couple that just wept as they both, husband and wife, just received Jesus. 
gave their lives to Christ. And I watched as God worked miracles in people's hearts. And I thought to myself, this is what we're called to do, church. We're called to see the church expand, the family grow, people meet Jesus. And this is the last observation I want to make today about a spirit-filled church. A spirit-filled church is an ever-expanding community. I want to invite you into that ever-expanding community because that is the power that is hidden in the spirit-filled church. It's always expanding. It's always going to the next level. And so what could happen? I just pray that this sermon as we start this series would spark a fire in your heart, spark a desire and a hunger in your heart. What could happen if we all started to seek God for an outpouring of his Holy Spirit in the month of July and into August? What could happen in our family of faith? Even in this time where we're meeting in our homes and you're watching the sermon on a computer right now or on your TV, what could happen even now in your heart if you turned off the Netflix, you got on your knees, you started reading the book of Acts and you said to God, God, make my life look like this chapter. Make my life. You said the old and the young, God. You said the male and the female. You said all flesh. That includes me. God, would you make my life, God, would you make me hungry for an outpouring and a filling of your Holy Spirit? God, I love you and I've experienced your power and I'm thankful, but I long for more. You know, one of my favorite stories is the story of D.L. Moody, an old preacher from Chicago in the 1800s. D.L. Moody, for a long time, preaching year after year after year, saw small results, no big move of God's Spirit, no big transformation of the city, but he was faithful to preach year after year, month after month, service after service. But he became hungry for the Holy Spirit. He began to seek God in prayer for a greater experience of the Holy Spirit. And then he wrote this. He said, one day in the city of New York, oh, what a day, I cannot describe it. I seldom refer to it. It is almost too sacred an experience to name. I can only say that God revealed himself to me. And I had such an experience of his love that I had to ask him to stay his hand. I went to preaching again. The sermons were not different. I did not present any new truths and yet hundreds were converted. I would not now be placed back where I was before that blessed experience if you should give me all the world. It would be small dust in the balance. So here's a question for you this Sunday as we launch into this series, Brave, because I believe the Holy Spirit is calling you to a greater pursuit of Him. Are you content with your current experience of God? Are you? Because you know what I feel like, church? I want more. I want more of God. I want more of His love in my heart. I want more of his truth in my life. I want more of his vision in my eyes. I want more. Do you want more? Do you even now feel a stirring, a hunger, a thirst, pulling you, drawing you, calling you? Because I know that God's Holy Spirit desires to be poured out in your life in greater measure. And there's a promise that you can hold on to with me. In Luke chapter 11, spoken by the lips of Jesus he said, so if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? What could happen in our church at Vox if for the next 28 days, every single one of us read a chapter from the book of Acts and asked for a greater filling of the Holy Spirit? What could happen? What could happen in 28 days if every single one of us gathered at these revival nights, worshiped Jesus with our whole hearts, and called for a greater filling of the Holy Spirit? What could happen? What could happen if collectively we started seeking God in unison, just like they did in the book of Acts, far more than 120 unified, seeking God, pursuing Him, imperfect, broken people who don't deserve it, but are calling out for a move of His Spirit? What could happen in your family, in our community? in our own hearts. 
I just want to pray for you right now. And I want to invite you on this journey with me because I think the next 28 days, God's going to do something fresh in our church and he's going to do something fresh in your heart. So right where you are, would you open your heart to this? Go ahead, bow your head, close your eyes. I want to pray for you. And if you're here today and you can hear my voice and you'd say, Justin, I want a greater filling of the Holy Spirit. I want greater power in my life. I want a greater experience of his presence, of his nearness. Just right now, put up your hands as though they were a cup that could be filled. And I want to pray that the Holy Spirit would fill it. Lord, I thank you for hungry people, me included, Lord. I want a greater filling of the Holy Spirit. I believe you have more of your presence, of your power, of your life available now. And God, for too long, we have been content. For too long, I have been content with my current experience. And I say, Lord, I'm calling out for more. I'm crying out for more. God, our world is in desperate need to see people who have a spiritual unity. It only comes with an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. God, our world is in desperate need to see the love of Christ manifest. It only comes by the work of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we call to you. I pray for every person with their hand up. I pray in the name of Jesus. Fill them with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Lord, let your Spirit give a fresh filling, a new filling, a new hunger, a new passion, a new love, a new desire. Lord, I pray pour out your Holy Spirit even through this screen right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And Lord, we just say together we're committed to seeking you these 28 days through the book of Acts and in prayer. We're committed to seeking your face. Even in this time where we're still social distancing and everything else, we know that you're not distant from us. And so we just say yes today. Right where you are with your head bowed, with your eyes closed, I always want to give an opportunity for any person that's hearing my voice right now who is far from God to say yes to Jesus Christ today, right here, right now. And if all the saints that are watching this right now, don't turn it off, pray. Pray, because this is, this is someone's moment right now. This is somebody's moment. So every member of our church, every follower of Jesus, just right now, just pray that God would convict that person, that neighbor, that friend. You might be watching this, you're on the other side of the world, or you might be watching this and you're right down the street. But if you're here today and you're far from God, I wanna give you an invitation to come close. The greatest news in this life is that God loves you and that he's not nearly as far as you thought he was. That Christ came to live a perfect life that you and I could not that he died a substitutionary death so that on the cross, he paid your debt in full before God. See, you and I have a problem called sin. It lives deep inside our hearts, but Christ paid the debt of sin that you and I committed by shedding his blood and dying in our place. And when Jesus rose from the dead, he offers new life to all those who would believe. You can't earn it, you can't deserve it, but you can freely, humbly receive it. And if you have the humility and the courage to receive the gift of God's salvation by faith through grace, you can fully forever be forgiven and have eternal life. So right now I wanna lead you in a prayer. It requires that you turn, the Bible calls that repentance, to God and away from self, that you place your faith in him, that you let go of your sin, and that you trust in Christ for salvation. See, listen, right now, God's called you, and he's drawing you to himself. So would you open your heart to Christ? Pray with me this prayer right now. Father, save me. I turn to Jesus. Jesus, I believe, Tell him, you died and rose again. Forgive my sin and take my life. I surrender. I place my faith in you. Fill me with the Holy Spirit and with peace. Amen. If you are far from God and you just prayed that prayer, make sure you text Jesus to the number on the screen right now. One of our leaders would love to pray with you, stand with you in that decision of faith. Church, I want to encourage you. Acts chapter one is today. Monday, Acts chapter two. Tuesday, Acts chapter three. We're going to walk through this whole book of the book of Acts together. I believe God's going to speak to you. I'm going to pray for you and we're going to be dismissed. God, I thank you for a new hunger that's growing in the heart of your people. I pray that you would use these 28 days just to set our hearts on fire. And I ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit in miracles, in signs, in wonders, in a fresh love, in a new passion, in a greater devotion, that this would be a time where the Holy Spirit is poured forth in power like we've never known before. I pray a blessing over your people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.